And so I knew that I liked my job, but the idea that, oh my God, I, I can't stop doing this. And so if I set my life up in such a way that I have to make this much money to live, then I have to do that. And that was really terrifying to me, even in you know mid to late 20s. And so I started laying that foundation long before I wanted to leave. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Millennial Investing Podcast. I'm your host today, Patrick Donnelly. And joining me on today's show is Lauren Keen Allman from Adulting is Easy. Lauren, welcome to the show. Hey, Patrick. Thanks for having me. I am happy to have you here. I wanted to just jump right in and hear a little bit about how you got turned on to personal finance, financial independence, all those kind of topics. Like, when did that first come online for you? How'd you get interested in it? Who were some of your influences? I've always been pretty good with money, even as a child. You know, like I would get a gift card or something or cash and I'd like put it away or save it. My brother would always like immediately want to go to the store and find something to buy with it, just as like an example. Uh, so generally, personal finance has come somewhat naturally to me. I also got a finance degree. So that tells you where I'm naturally kind of headed in life. But when I was younger, when I was 22, I had graduated from college. I was working as a front end department supervisor at Toys R Us. That was, you know, hey, great financial crisis times, right? And one thing I did do was buy a home in 2012. So I went under contract when I was 22 and closed when I was 23. And that wasn't some grand scheme to like build equity and invest in real estate, et cetera. It was sort of like my payment was 725 and I think splitting an apartment with my friend was 800. You know, it was like, no, the apartment was much nicer than the house. But, you know, it was really a kind of a cash flow decision at the time. And two years after that, I got into sales and I started making much better money. I got into sales to make more money. I was in, I went, I went from Toys R Us to accounting to sales and I was making, you know, six figures, like 25 years old. And the equity on the house was building quite a bit. And I realized I had a net worth of, I think, like $100,000 or something. And I remember thinking, okay, if I could do this by accident, I wonder what I could do if I did it on purpose. And then naturally being in sales, there was a pretty good delta between income, my income and my expenses. And so over time, you get to the point where I was maxing my 401k, maxing my Roth, and there was still some money. And so naturally, I invested it, really tried it. No, I didn't. I bought a house in a BMW. I bought a house in a golf course community in a BMW instead. Um, but, you know, because I thought I had made it and, and what have you. But for a while there, it was going really good in the, in the mid-20s. Nice. So I, I know that your father had a big influence on you on kind of like your mental models and blue, you know, your financial blueprints. I know you're a fan of uh, the psychology of money, Morgan Housel. And I wanted to hear a little bit about some of the lessons that your father taught you, like just in terms of how your mental models and your financial blueprints, how they developed. My dad is definitely a huge influence on my life. I'm also just very similar to him naturally, whether that's nature or nurture. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. My husband and I have debates on whether why I'm so much like my father. Um, but he the main thing he really taught us growing up was both of my parents were very open about money with me. I guess I'd have to ask my brother, who's two years younger than me, if he felt the same way or if maybe me being already predisposed to, uh, you know, money, personal finance, perhaps I was asking questions and being curious and they just didn't know what to do other than answer me. I, I don't, I'm not exactly sure. But so, for example you know, they bought a brand new truck in 1999. And I remember, and I was nine years old. And I remember having this conversation about why are you getting a brand new truck? Why wouldn't you get a used truck? Right? They, you know, you're supposed to get a good deal on a used truck because they depreciate so much right away. And we had this whole conversation and I knew how much the truck was. And I remember when they were doing the negotiating and, and all of that. And then a few years later, 2004, they bought a Yukon and they financed it at 0% instead of paying cash. And I was like, well, you paid cash for the truck. Why didn't you pay cash for the Yukon? You know, and so, you know, and they were always just answering these types of questions for me. Right. And so just that being open with it really just allowed me to learn a lot from them. Uh, my dad specifically 
really, he grew up one of five. My grandfather was in sales. My grandmother was the homemaker for the five kids, five kids in seven years. Good Catholics, right? And right. they went to a Catholic school. And so there just wasn't, when you're paying for all that, there just wasn't a ton of money. But in you know private schools, you can be around a lot of wealth. Mm -hmm. And so that could have easily made my dad be the type to kind of like resent wealth. But I think it actually made him look at it kind of critically. And I think he knew I'm at this school. These people are at the school. We're at the same place, but we have very different financial backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And he always made sure that we understood that just because, you know, you can all kind of be in the same positions, but not everybody has the same financial background when you really look under the hood. And I can think of two real two examples. There was a family that we knew growing up that had like multiple homes and, you know, boats and, you know, all these vacation homes and all of these toys. And it wasn't too long after that, that we found out that they were really bankrupt. Right. And that was a big eye-opening thing. And my dad took that as a moment to be like, you see, it looked like they were much wealthier than us, but it did not take much for them to not have anything. And that happened to someone else that we knew, these people. I mean, God, these kids had all the cool stuff that I wanted so bad. And it turns out like the dad was doing something illegal in their company. I don't know if he was like embezzling. I think it, I think he was like a some kind of service business that was taking money and then not fulfilling. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden they had nothing and they didn't have the business and they didn't have the nice house. And so my dad kind of really explained to us that just because you have stuff doesn't mean that you have wealth. And that was a big thing that I took away. They were also, both of my parents were very clear about the fact that we could have more than we had. Mm -hmm. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. And we knew that she had been making more money when I was born and that that was a hard decision for her to leave versus my dad. But my dad's career had more upside. And we knew like there, there right there is a, is a decision to not make as much money as you possibly can, to not make money the number one thing. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, as my dad started to do better in his career, we knew that we knew that they could afford more than they were doing. And they were making a very conscious decision not to. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that we really talked too much about why that was, but we, I certainly knew it is good to spend less than you make. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I knew like, oh, because you need to save this much. And the more you save, the earlier you can retire and 4% rule. And I didn't know any of that. I just knew that you should spend less than you make. And there are people around you that you'll never know how much they really are making or how much they really have. One of my favorite chapters in the Morgan Housel book the psychology of money is the last one called Confessions, where he talks about just how he manages his own money. And one of the things he talks about is like, forget about the Joneses. Like they are, it's like kind of a real trap to look at the Joneses. Don't keep up with them. You know, you never know the real story. And, you know, to your point, like things can be really bad actually when things look good on the outside. That was uh, a huge takeaway of my childhood. Not don't drive the nicest car. Don't have the nicest house that you possibly can. Yeah. So did, uh, did your, did you have any side hustles as a, as a kid growing up or were you, I know you were involved in sports and things like that, but did you, were you entrepreneurial as a kid? I wasn't, I, I don't know if, I, I suppose I'm an entrepreneur now. I don't know if I majored in it or I think more so I minored in it later in life. I wasn't the kid out there. Is it Warren Buffett? That was like, I don't know, selling pine cones or selling dirt or something, you know, something, you know, he had the paper route, you know, whatever there's all these entrepreneurs. I don't have a great story like that. All I really did was I would save allowances. We had a $3 a week allowance. Sometimes my brother would be a bad influence on me and make me buy Pokemon cards mm -hmm. and then take them from me probably. Right. But like I would save allowances and I would save birthday money. And as my sister was born, she was born when I was 13. So I started babysitting for her and her friends. I would save all of the babysitting money. But I was so it was like any money that came my way, I tried to keep. But I wasn't really the type to go out and try to make it specifically. Yeah. It sounds like, you know, the marshmallow test, the Stanford marshmallow test. It sounds like, you know, where you give kids like a choice to have like a mushroom now or a marshmallow now. Or if you wait 15 minutes, you get two. It seems like you were a kid that would have passed the marshmallow test and delayed gratification and, and probably, uh, you know, waited for your second marshmallow. Oh, I, I for sure would have. Yeah. I've been, I think, generally very connected with my future self all through my life yeah. and a good predictor of how my future self is going to feel. 
-hmm. or at least understanding that my future self is probably not going to feel exactly like my present self does and that I need to leave some leeway for change and growth. I know you had an English teacher when you were, I think, in high school that said that you should be an English teacher, right? So I wanted to hear about that a little bit and like what your, like at a young age, what your career aspirations were. That was surprising. I grew up, I was like the math science kid. I was told I'm left brained. Mm -hmm. Getting into high school and writing and having this English teacher just really praise me to myself and other students. That was so strange to realize that I yeah, maybe I was a little more level in the left and right brain. Uh, but to get to your actual question, I didn't know what I wanted to be. I actually, my first, I very, like my first semester of college, I took a class, a one credit class on like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Like, mm -hmm. that's how long I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And I ended up majoring in finance because, you know, I like money, maybe. But also there were only like a list of acceptable majors that my parents would support and business was one of them. And it wasn't allowed to be general business. It wasn't allowed to be marketing. It wasn't allowed to be management. So I basically had to pick between like accounting and finance. And so I chose finance. I just I just figured business will open the most doors. If if you ask me now and if you ask me as a kid, and my grandma would tell you this, that I used to say this, that I wanted to be a news anchor, which is interesting now being a podcaster because it's maybe like a little bit related. So, but, you know, I really, really didn't know deep down. I, I don't think I wanted to be a news anchor in the sense that I wanted to wake up at 3 a.m. and be on the morning news. I don't know that I, I'm, I'm not a morning person. I don't know that I ever would have sacrificed enough to get there. But when I was a kid, I know I, I used to say that. Yeah, we'll get into the podcasting later because I definitely want to hear about some of that stuff. but. I wanted to hear about, you said you started off at Toys R Us, then it sounds like you did accounting for a little while and then sales. At what stage of the game did you realize like, I want out of this altogether. I want to like create a plan to like get rid of my W-2 and have enough. I don't really believe in passive income, but you know, cash flow to cover my living expenses so I can basically have freedom and optionality. What, talk to me a little bit about that progression. I did accounting and sales for the same company. So I did accounting for a year and then they opened up an inside sales team and I was like, can I do that? And they were like, sure. I mean, I guess we'll let spreadsheet Lauren do sales. <laughs> and then they, you know, promoted me a couple of times over the next few years. But so no, I just wanted to hear about like, at what stage of the oh, game did, did, did you decide to leave the W-2 and really formulate a plan to, to, you know, create financial independence? I started laying the foundation for financial dependence before I wanted to leave at all. Mm -hmm. Again, it's this idea of current self versus, versus future self. I knew that my current self liked the company I worked for. I sold business finance training. Like, you know, I was able to go to the office two days and stay home a couple of days. I made good money. I liked the people I worked with, but I did recognize that it might not always be like that. Those external factors might change or the internal factors, how I felt might change. And so I knew that I liked my job, but the idea that, oh my God, I, I can't stop doing this. I'm worth the most to the society in terms of wages as someone who sells training. Mm -hmm. And so if I set my life up in such a way that I have to make this much money to live, then I have to do that. And that was really terrifying to me, even in you know mid to late 20s. And so I started laying that foundation long before I wanted to leave. That company that I worked for sold in-person training. I was smart enough to know that that wasn't the future. Mm -hmm. People didn't have time to sit in full day in-person training classes. I made the decision to actually leave that job to sell custom training, which could be virtual, mm -hmm. in February 2020, which was really smart, uh, you know, because nobody could do in-person training from March 2020 on for quite a while. So I had laid that foundation. I did try, you know, I tried working with that company. That company then wasn't doing well because of COVID. I went to another company where I sold training and they, they were just bigger. They're restructuring left and right, giving me a new role than I thought I would have. And then I, by then we were financially independent. The real estate was paying our bills. And then I was able to just take this deep breath and leave. Mm -hmm. But it was because I set started setting that foundation way before I ever wanted to leave. And some of it was 
I knew that I basically my skills, my six figure skills, you know, I, I, my W2 peaked at $200,000 when I was 28. That was related to my skills selling in person training. And I knew that wouldn't be around forever. And so I sort of was anticipating some of that, but also like maybe someday I'm just not going to want to deal with corporate life anymore. So let's get into the foundation that you built that allowed you to leave. I know real estate was a huge part of it. You had mentioned you bought a house in 2012, but talk to us about your first steps in real estate investing, what you did, and then a little bit about like what your current portfolio looks like. I do consider my first primary home to be my first foray into real estate. I know some people say primary homes, not an asset, what have you. I did have a roommate, so... Mm -hmm. My payment was seven twenty five. He was paying me like five fifty a month, so that's really an investment. And then, of course, I made improvements to the home, so I forced some equity to the home. It appreciated naturally because the economy was turning around and things like that. So when I was twenty seven, I veered off path in the sense that I was like, "All right, I got some extra money. I know what that means. Nicer house, nicer car, right?" So I bought, you know. When I was 27, I bought this nice house, golf course community, BMW. And I was like, I am living the dream, baby. <laughs> move my move my boyfriend in and all that. Who's now my husband. And the one thing I did that was good was I kept that first house. And so it really, truly then became an investment at that point. And that's really in 2017, when I was 27, that's really when I sort of truly became a landlord and became what I would say everybody would agree on. You're a real estate investor. You have a rental property. Later on, I traded that into it because I had lived there two or five years. So there were no capital gains taxes. So I traded that into a duplex. I was like two units better than one unit. Mm -hmm. And over time have scaled up like that. So for example, that equity now from that duplex was 1031 exchanged into a six unit apartment building. And so it's been a lot of sort of trading up over time, letting the equity build, but also injecting my own money and, and later a little bit of my husband's money into the portfolio here and there for investments as well. Um, now we are primarily focused on short-term rentals and we're all on the West coast of Florida. So we have 12 units right now. It's eight short-term rentals and four long-term rentals on the West coast of Florida. And it is that 12 is really where we felt like we had hit financial independence and I was allowed to leave my job kind of whenever I wanted. I did work for probably one more year just to be sure and made sure that the, the real estate nor my husband and our personal finances needed any money from my job. So it sounded like at 27, you kind of got lured away like a, the siren song of like chasing society's dream. You know, you got the BMW, you got, you know, a place on a golf course community, kind of fell into some of the, um, whatever traps, I guess, C could be potential traps that our society teaches us and really pushes and, and, in many ways, like uh, values, I would say. So talk to us about, it sounded like you went through a bit of a rough patch. Like, I don't, I don't know if you had like an awakening of some sort, but you got back on track to financial independence after kind of maybe veering off track a little bit. Talk to us about that stage. Yeah, I mean, between TV shows and, you know, family conversations at holidays and what your friends are talking about, it's easy to craft in your mind what your life should look like go to college, get a good job, get married, have kids, drive a nice car, go on nice vacations, et cetera. And so consciously or subconsciously, you're making that your goal. And so I had hit it, not, not all of it, obviously. I wasn't married, but my husband did live with me, didn't have kids, you know, but I, I had hit it pretty well. I mean, six figures, BMW, nice house. And there was no feeling of relief. There was no feeling of accomplishment. And that's when I really ran the numbers and realized, if this is my life, I have to do this for like ever. And that was, that's the opposite of freedom. That's the op that's like the opposite of accomplishment. It was like, it was almost like life had accomplished something to me, right? Like right. I didn't accomplish anything in life. Like life had trapped me in this, in this way of doing things. About that same time, the reason I bought the BMW, the reason I needed a car at the time I bought the BMW, I should say is I was in a car accident. Mm -hmm. And so I was sandwiched. There's a bridge here in the Tampa Bay area called the Howard Franklin. And I was sandwiched in it, on it. Not my fault. You know, person behind me stepped on the gas instead of the brake and ran me into the car in front of me. And that totaled my Acura. The first car I'd ever bought myself. I'd had it two years. I love that car. Yeah. 
I still miss it. I still see it on the road. I'm like, oh, what, that? <laughs> what my life would be like, right? Uh, but I was 26 years old. I had been dieting, working out. I was on my way to see a comedy show with some friends and have a nice cheat meal at Red Lobster. It was going to be awesome. Didn't make it, obviously. Yeah. So my car's totaled. I've got back pain and neck pain. I really thought like whiplash and all that was a bunch of BS and like a money grab until that right. point. It is absolutely not. It was terrible. And so I went through this process. You know, I couldn't I couldn't lift weights the way I had before. I definitely couldn't run. I couldn't like carry anything heavy. I was worried about my ability to travel for work because mm -hmm. um, I sold in-person trains for a lot of, you know, a lot of materials that I had to take with me. I did kind of start shipping those ahead of time after that. But, you know, it was a really hard time. I drank a lot of red wine. I still drink a lot of red wine, but I was drinking like a lot, a lot then and not working out because I know how I didn't know how to move and use my body in, in that state. And so I gained weight. And so I think there was this combination of this car accident, this chronic pain, this uncertainty about the future, mourning the life that I had had on top of feeling like I should be happy because if you objectively looked at my life, it was exactly what what I would have told you I wanted and what society would have told you any 27 year old should want. I mean, I remember one time I was going to therapy and I was going to therapy. I was talking to my dad on the phone and he's like, you have like two houses. Like, why are you depressed? I was like, good question. <laughs> you know, like I was diagnosed with depression around then and, you know, really had to do a lot of work on myself and, you know, dug myself out of that. It took, took probably a year or so. And, Huge kudos for my then boyfriend, now husband, and my work and everything for bearing with me during those times. But I wasn't living my purpose, my what my values are, how I was living wasn't aligned with who I truly am as a person. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard pill to swallow because you've got to unwind some things in that world. I mean, you've got to sell the BMW, right. buy a Honda Accord, mm -hmm. sell the golf course house buy a, you know, a, a, it's kind of a triplex, bought a house so that it's two rentals on it, you know, and, and some of those things. And, you know, from the outside, I'm certain people thought we were wealthier than, than we are now. But at the time, I was worth 300 grand, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, and that's six years ago. And now we're with, you know, two and a half million. Right. You know, we're doing much better now, but from the outside, we're not looking as good. But I like getting up in the morning a lot more now than I did back then. Yeah, that's a tough spot to be in, to have all the things that you think are going to make you happy and they don't. And then it's just like, well, what do I do now? You feel like it's a bit of a rug pull. And I remember I went through the same kind of thing and I just felt like I'd been hornswoggled, like I'd been tricked. <laughs> like, it felt yeah. like I followed it this feels script. That way. And then you're like mad at yourself. Right. Like, dang, I let them get me. <laughs> right, right. But uh, yeah, unpacking it all. And then actually, you know, it's kind of, I kind of like, it's like the hero's journey or heroine's journey. It's like you figure out a life that's true and authentic for you. And, you know, to find that you go through a lot of rough patches. It's not a, it's not, I'm sure you've seen that chart of like what success looks like. It's not like this upward trajectory. Oh, it's no. like, you know, a lot of. No, no. And I don't want anybody to think I've got it like 100% figured out. Sure. You know, we hit financial independence, our real estate's paying our bills, but then you have this question of, is this the lifestyle that I want forever? Right. And okay, now I do not ever have to work again. Right. But do I want to tweak my lifestyle in such a way that I maybe my husband, not probably not me, my husband needs to work maybe a little longer to up our lifestyle or something like that. So that that's kind of where we're at now. So I don't want people to think like I've, I've figured out the secret of life, but at these periodic check-ins with yourself and your values and your, your spouse mm -hmm. are huge. I wanted to get into a little bit about the importance of finding and picking the right strategy in terms of real estate. Like it sounded like you did a couple of different, different investments. How did you go about picking the right strategy that worked for you? I think there's a natural journey that real estate investors go on. A lot of us start like I did with a single family home. That's what we know. I mean, if we didn't grow up in a single family home, we probably know people that did. Right. And so we sort of start there. It doesn't take too long where if you take that kind of seriously, you start realizing, man, duplexes, triplexes, quads here in the United States, they have great financing options for those. Maybe I should trade up into those. And then a lot of people move on from there to larger commercial properties, you know, big 
big apartment buildings or, you know, true commercial with, you know, developing or office buildings or something like that. And I've sort of stopped along the way there at the small multifamily. We've got four small multifamily properties right now. So I, I like, I like this level that I'm at. I think it's, I'm kind of at what I think is the highest level that a quote unquote mom and pop investor can be with the four properties, the 12 units, eight long-term, I'm sorry, eight short-term, four long-term rentals, managing yourself. I mean, this is really about the most, I think one person or one couple can do, especially with all the other stuff that we have going on. So I like the small multifamilies. There's a lot of efficiencies there and things like that. And I don't feel like I'm quite ready to buy, you know, syndicate or just buy a large, large building for myself. But then the question other other than like, what kind of property are you going to buy once you even settle on what your strategy there is going to be like a small multi? You've got to decide for me, it was long term or short term. There's also midterm rentals and student rentals. And there's all these different kind of strategies within the actual type of property that you're buying. And there's no really way to know, I don't think, what's right for you unless you do them, unless you try these different things. And I knew single family homes weren't for me. I know long term rentals really aren't for me. You know, short term rentals, especially, you know, I'm in Florida. So I, I have a natural, I think, leg up from a lot of people because a lot of people want to come here. So it's easier to have them and profit from them. But people are happy, <laughs> you know, for the most part. I mean, the amount of people I see from Montana that walk out and I'll be like, oh, it's a little cold today. It's like 50. They're like, it's four at my house. Right. Oh, okay. Well, great. Right. You know what I mean? Like they're happy and they're grateful. They're like, wow. Think, you know, you did a really good job in this place. Thank you for what you do. And you get so rewarded for um, like keeping the properties up, making them beautiful. You get to use them sometimes, you know, yeah. there's a lot of good stuff about short-term rentals versus long-term rentals. And I don't like having tenants that much i mean they really have a lot of power over you Mm -hmm. they have i mean they can really do a ton of financial damage to you and if you're talking to a tenant it's not usually because they're happy you know right and so i just knew that my personality and my location suited short-term rentals but i don't think you can know that about yourself unless maybe you just really know yourself really well but i think probably you kind of have to get started and just know that it's okay to to change once you're in. I mean, nobody's going to be like, wow, Lauren said, Lauren, when she introduced herself, said she was a single family home investor. Now she's got multis. I don't like her anymore. Like, that's, just, that's just not going to happen. Yeah. I, I wanted to hear about your real estate educational journey. Like how did, how did you go about learning? What were some of the, you know, books, podcasts, things that made a big impact on you along your, along the way? Yeah. So when I bought that golf course community house, the one good thing I did was I kept my first house as a rental. And really the reason I think I did that, my parents had one rental property my whole life. So in my brain, I'm like, one rental property, good, living the dream. Mm-hmm. And so I did keep that one. And that is when I, you know, really got into Bigger Pockets, the Bigger Pockets podcast and read a bunch of those, a bunch of different books, a bunch of Bigger Pockets books, but other books as well, learning about real estate. I'm like, okay, now I don't just have a roommate that pays me anymore. Now I'm a landlord there. You know, I have to think about leases and landlord tenant law and systematizing and how to vet tenant tenants and give what what's the rules for giving notice and what do I want the rent to be and all of these things. And so that's when I really started reading all of those books. And it doesn't take too long before you're also getting into the personal finance space. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's so many connections there between personal finance and real estate that I then really got into, you know, reading the personal finance books and getting more into personal finance at that point as well. How do you get started with stock investing? I've put together a course to teach you everything I wish I knew when I first started investing in stocks. Let's start at the beginning and ask what is a stock? Let's zoom on in into what it's actually like to buy a stock. A few options are Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, Ally, E-Trade. Fortunately, you won't have to necessarily calculate all of these taxes yourself. I'll outline a few main ones to be aware of throughout your lifetime investing journey. As Warren Buffett says, your best investment is yourself. There's nothing that compares to it. By the end, you'll be savvier about stock investing and personal finance than the vast majority of people. Even if you're not a total beginner, I'm confident you'll get a lot out of the principles and strategies I outline, which we'll build on throughout. A link to the course is available in the description below. See you there. 
Uh, you had mentioned maybe on Twitter that your money or your life was a, a book that you would recommend. Are there that that made a big impact on me too in my financial journey? A huge impact, actually. Do, were there any other books like in the personal finance space that that also like you you'd say like anybody needs to check out, read, and learn from? I love your money, your life. Mm -hmm. I love set for life. I will teach you to be rich. The simple path to wealth. Psychology of money. I like all of those books. Most of those I read to see if I can recommend them for people. Even back then. Yeah. So, like your money, your life. The big thing with your money, your life that they're trying, they're teaching you there is there's more to your job than money. For example, if you spend an hour commuting in an hour you know, an hour each way commuting and then you spend an hour complaining about your job when you get home mm -hmm. and you're not cooking because of your job because you spend so much time there. So you have to go out all the time. There's all these other costs with your job. And there's also this idea of like, what is my net worth? How much money have I made in my life versus how much have I kept? You know, and all of those things, I had sort of accidentally done those exercises in my mid twenties. Um, but if you haven't done those types of exercises, and really just taking a high level overview, a high level look at your life, then your money or your life is greater or any of those other ones that I recommended. Yeah. Yeah. Those are all good ones that you mentioned. And I'll put those in the show notes. I, I want to know, like looking back on things, like in terms of your, if you were to start your investing journey over, was there anything that you would change, like that you wish you had known at the start of things that you would have done differently that would have maybe accelerated how quickly you could have left your W-2? So a house hacking is when we've talked about it, but we haven't defined it yet. Yeah, That's when you buy a property, live in part of it and rent other parts of it out. So that's what I was doing. I didn't know. I don't even know. Maybe, maybe that term was around then, but I didn't know what it was. When I had a roommate, you can have a roommate or you can buy a duplex, live in one part of it, rent the other out or a quad. There's other things you can do too, like rent out parking spaces, rent out your pool, rent out your yard, things like that. Mm -hmm. I wish I'm doing that now. I've done that four times, but I took that big detour in the middle where I bought the house in the golf course community and the BMW. And I, if I could go back, I would just house hack. I would just keep house hacking mm -hmm. and keep and keep the one, right? Buy a duplex, live on one side, rent the other side out. Buy another duplex, move out of that one, keep it, live on one side, rent the other side out and keep repeating over and over. I would, I'm still doing that now, but I would probably go back and not take that detour. So are you are still house hacking now, you said? Yeah. So tell me about that. How, how does that work? How do you like it? Do you think you'll reach a stage where you're like, I'm done house hacking? Well, that's part of the question that I was talking about with lifestyle. Yeah. Right. We're, we're house hacking. We're financially dependent. Our real estate pays our bills. Right. If we buy a, for us, $1.5 million house in the water, right. that changes that calculus. Sure. But your lifestyle is really good. Right. right. So um, here we we bought a bed and breakfast. This is a single family home, three bedroom, two and a half bath, sixteen hundred ish square feet, with two ADUs in the back that are on um, Airbnb that we rent out. And so it's house hacking, but you know they are separate from our home, and they're on the other side of the backyard. So we see them, but we can go out the front door and not see them. You know, um, this is we've done it four times. I mean, I bet I guess like so. I had the I had the roommates, then we bought this, and then we've also bought two other duplexes. And we moved into each of those duplexes and then eventually circled around and moved back into here. Mm -hmm. So I've house hacked a total of four times. It's just a, it's just a question, you know, how, how much do, how much longer does my husband want to work? Right. You know, I'm three years older. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's 31 right now. You know, he owns his engineering firm. So there's just this question of how long is he going to work? And if he, and if he's not going to sell the firm for five or 10 more years, he's really got to work there till that we might as well go mm -hmm. get a house on the water because right. there's enough cash flow coming in every month that I don't, I mean, how much do you need is the question, right? So yeah, I think yeah. someday we're leaning towards a lifestyle upgrade, but some of that depends on what he decides to do with the engineering firm. I wanted to get into a little bit about that marriage and relationships and building wealth. Talk to me about how being married has helped or hindered or some of the challenges, like how do you guys make decisions? Just, I wanted to hear a little bit about your experience. I just got married a year ago, so I'm experiencing mm, some of the, uh, thanks. Yeah. Experiencing it's, you know, I'm used to making my own decisions and now yeah. I don't, <laughs> you know, so yeah, yeah. I wanted to hear about I what it's been like for you. Being older, 
being three years older than my husband. And we met when, I mean, he was 22 living with his dad still. I was 25. I was in that sales career. I had my house. It was a very, we met at a, there were, you know, even though we're only three years apart, it was a pretty big gap yeah. at the time. Yeah. And so we've been together eight years for the first four years before we got married. I kind of called the shots mm -hmm. because it was kind of up to me. Right. Like I bought the first house. I bought the second house. I mm -hmm. bought the first duplex. You know, I was sort of making these decisions. And then even when we got married and we bought this house, it was, I mean, I, we used equity from my other projects, some of them right, right here or my job. And so I sort of made a lot of the calls when it came to this property, even though we were married by that point. And so it was, it for us, it was not some, we're not married, now we're married. We make no joint decisions and we make all joint decisions. Mm -hmm. Even the four years that we've been married, it's been like, we've been slowly becoming more and more integrated. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely like, it's way better to be able to have somebody to bounce ideas off sure. of, to financially help in some situations. Like the last place we bought, he did half the down payment and I did half the down payment. Mm -hmm. Like, that was awesome. I didn't have yeah. to do that all by myself. Like, that was so cool. Right. Uh, you know, and then I was able to leave my job and he's there. Like, our our bills are paid by the real estate, but he's like, well, I'll take the, I'll take it from here kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you focus on managing the properties, house money, media, adulting is easy. Like, you do all that and I can do this. Like, that is so cool. A yeah. lot of people are not able to do that. That's why I have health insurance. Right. Right. You know right. I mean? right. And so like, there's just a lot of really good things and the sum is, is greater than its parts. Absolutely. Yep. I mean, the biggest challenge is, so he has the engineering firm and I have, a, you know, my background is in sales. And when you become a business owner versus just being an engineer, there's more sales and kind of businessy sure. thinking involved. So we talk about the firm a lot. We talk about our future a lot. We mm -hmm. talk about our investments a lot. We talk about the rentals a lot. Mm -hmm. And so it gets to be complicated being romantic partners yeah. and business partners yep. at the same time. And we have, we have not dialed that particularly in. And, and I think if anybody was a fly on the wall, they'd be like, wow, these people talk about money and business a lot. A lot. But it also just <laughs> really interests both of us. Sure. Um, but we try to set aside time where like, we're not doing that. Yeah. Like, let's just watch this sporting event. Right. You know, let's just go on this trip. Mm -hmm. Let's take a break. Yeah. Well, You've got so much going on too, that it's just like, that's what you talk about. My wife and I are the same thing. We've got a lot of different projects and a lot of different things we've got going on. And so money is discussed a lot. It's by necessity, but. I'm sure, you know, I think about this sometimes where you see couples that were together a really long time, yeah. get divorced, Yeah. especially like maybe they have kids and stuff. It's like, I think they, I assume, I don't know, but I think they just spend so much time raising the kids mm -hmm. and thinking about the kids and talking about the kids and not connecting as human beings and as yeah. romantic partners anymore. Right. And then the kids leave and they're looking at each other like, Oh crap. <laughs> I don't know you actually. Right. Like now that, the, now that that's not happening, I don't even know what we talk about. And so my husband and I often say that, you know, our real estate is our kids. We talk, sure. we're, you know, we're, we're talking about them, but we can't look up in 10 years and be like, dang, we have not connected right. romantically in a long time. You know? Right. Right. So when this comes out, it'll probably be 2024. Do you guys do like a year in review and like kind of like sit down and say, what do we want to accomplish this year? Are you, are you those kind of people or are you more like, let's just see what happens? In between. I mean, we're not, we're not going to sit down. We don't have to sit down and talk. Like we don't have to like set aside time and write stuff down. Like right. We've, we've pretty much got it. I mean, our, our big things for next year are to stabilize the portfolio. Mm -hmm. We didn't need my money. We didn't have any issues with the real estate portfolio for years. Of course, I leave and everything hits the fan at the same time. And so we we had enough emergency fund, but we're we're getting to the bottom of it. On the bright side, peak season in Florida for the Airbnbs is like January to May. And so that, you know, that emergency fund is going to be, you know, stocked back up. But basically, yeah. the our main goal for the next year is to stabilize the portfolio and probably sell one of our properties that we just have a lot of equity sitting there at this point. The return on equity looked really good when we had $100,000 sitting there. Mm -hmm. And over the last two years, that's gone from $100,000 of equity to 300. And all of a sudden, your return on equity is not as good. And we may want may want to make some changes, diversify out of Florida. I'm not sure. But so the main things are 
you know, get our emergency fund back up, restabilize the portfolio, and then maybe reallocate a little bit from that one property. And there's a chance with the one property that we sell it and maybe we'll put it in the stock market. We sort of used to have a goal back before the engineering firm because that's part of our net worth. But our goal, we used to want it to be like 50% stocks and 50% real estate. Mm -hmm. And we are way heavy on the real estate side. So there's a chance we rebalance that in there. I know it's not really a sexy answer. It's not, it's not like, we're no. going to take over the world next year, man. No, These are my smart good. goals. But... No, the, the breath. <laughs> no, this is good. This is really good. Do you, you mentioned the engineering firm. Do you get involved in, because you, because you have a sales background, do you get pretty involved in his company or is it kind of, you've got your thing and he's got his thing and uh, you're separate in that, that regard? I don't think it's business partners. No, I'm involved. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, we talk about stuff all the time yeah. and I help, you know, help him talk through ideas and help him bring ideas to the business. I doubt when he brings those ideas that he said, hey, Lauren thought we should do this. I don't think that's happening. Right, but, right. Yeah, I mean, certainly. And and being the the wife of someone who owns a business has been interesting and it makes you realize what Bill Gates or Bezos, what their spouses were doing and how involved they really are. Sure. And, you know, for those those divorces and stuff, people are like, why does she get anything? And I'm like, man, right. she was doing a lot. Right. I mean, she was holding it down. The whole reason he could start the business and take this risk mm -hmm. is because I was making the kind of money I was making. And I like could totally hold it down without him completely. Right. So, you know, there's some of that, too, where. Yeah, but I mean, basically, yes, I, I'm involved. I'm, I, 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 like I tell him, I'm, I'm like kind of like a sales coach, kind of like his business consultant, yeah. a sounding board, right? A little bit. I mean, but I, I doubt the business partners would say, yeah, Lauren, Lauren's part of this thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> so you've settled on Airbnbs as a strategy. Talk to us a, a little bit more about the economics of Airbnbs. Why you like Airbnbs versus, you know, a longer term rental. Talk to me a little bit about that and what it's been like for you. Depends from unit to unit what those numbers are. Mm -hmm. But I have a six-unit apartment building. Four of those are short-term rentals. Two are long-term rentals. The long-term rentals are rented at nine hundred and ten fifty, whereas the short-term rentals bring in over three thousand each top line. There's more expenses there, but yeah. you're getting a lot. Really, the bottom line is a lot more for Airbnbs. It's a lot more work. Sure. So for my long-term rentals, it's like if they, let's say may, maybe once a month, I got some old ACs in that building. Maybe once a month I hear from them about something. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe once a quarter. Let's say once a quarter. Right. But like, and then if they don't pay rent, I have to call. That's it. And they mm -hmm. would never not pay, like they would not pay rent by accident. Mm -hmm. They're a little bit older. Mm -hmm. But like, that's it. For the short-term rentals, like, yes, am I making two or three times as much? Yes. I'm working more than two or three times more. Mm-hmm. It's probably like 15, 20 minutes a day versus 15, 20 minutes a week or a month, you know? So would you qualify or classify yourself as a real estate professional? Are you familiar with that term and designation? Like, uh, the, This is the question, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I had a job till June. Uh -huh. And so the answer for 2023 is no. Right, right. Any plans to change the, the existing long-term rentals just go whole hog, 100% Airbnb? No. No? We're not going to do that. There's a little... I'm not an Airbnb bust person, obviously. Yeah. yeah. But I do believe in some level of diversification and not going all eggs in one basket. The last duplex that we bought is both long-term rentals. So as we've switched, we had a duplex that was one short-term, one long-term. Both of those are short-term. The six unit was three and three. Now it's four and two. As we've gone away from long-term rentals in those properties, we wanted to backfill it with a couple more long-term rentals. So I think the, let's see, eight to eight to four. So, I mean, what is that? Two thirds, two thirds of the. I don't do public math. Be. I don't know. <laughs> I think eight divided by two is four, six, two thirds. Yeah. Two -thirds. So two thirds of the portfolio being short-term rentals. I think that works for us. That allows for enough diversification and kind of level cash flow. Yeah, that makes sense. I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk podcasting. You've been podcasting for over four years. I think you've done over 150 episodes at this point. 
wanted to hear a little bit about some of your biggest lessons from your favorite guests, just in terms of like uh, financial independence, people that have made a big impact on you. There's always like a handful of guests that are like, wow, that blew my socks off. Talk to me a little bit about that. What I love about podcasting is meeting all of these different people. And a lot of my guests are from Twitter because that's where yeah. that's my largest platform. What I love when I talk to them, you can have, you know, my my friend Andy is the crypto guy. Right. My friend David knows like a lot about the financial markets and came on and talked about bonds. My friend Brad came on and talked about stocks. And mm -hmm. it's so cool to learn these different things from these different people. But also there's always something that I learn about them mm -hmm. that is surprising, you know, because social media, the way the algorithms work, like you are rewarded for kind of pounding like the same kind of thought. Sure. You become kind of a lot, not like a three or four dimensional human being. Mm -hmm. And so that's really some of my favorite part about it. In terms of like big overarching, like personal finance themes, I can't think of any because adulting is easy is so broad. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so broad that the only thing that you are getting reinforced every single week is that personal finance is personal. There's no one approach that works for everybody. I can't tell you, Patrick, that you should invest in bonds. I can't tell you, you should invest in stocks. I yeah. can't tell if you should invest in real estate. And maybe at the beginning of adulting is easy. Maybe I thought that's what everybody was going to get out of it. I'm not sure like what they should exactly do, but they are at least getting more information so that they can make their own decisions. The other side of it too is these people are mostly a lot. There's a lot of content creators. That's how I know these people. Mm -hmm. And they always wow me with their discipline, their consistency, mm -hmm. and their goal setting and their growth. I mean, that's been a really cool part of this too, is like personal finance aside, just learning from these people how to be a, you know, kind of a consistent, disciplined person. Yeah. How did the name Adulting is Easy come about? How did you choose that name? Man. Or what's it mean? To you. Adulting is easy is about we make adulting easier if we make money easier. Right. If you're not worried about where your next meal is going to come from, your life becomes quite a bit easier. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Like you get a flat tire. It's a bigger deal if you have zero dollars than if you have a couple thousand, right. you know, right. and it just makes your life easier. You know, you maybe you don't have these big medical emergencies because you have health insurance and you have preventive care and you have preventive medicine and so that's the idea of adulting is easy. I hated the word adulting at first. Like when I, I'm like, oh, adulting is so stupid. But I started thinking about it as it relates to personal finance. You know, we talk about adulting. It's like, do you know how to put, you know, put a new button on your pants or mm -hmm. hem your pants? And do you call and make your own doctor's appointments? Like there's that part of it too. But right around 2017, I just had this epiphany where it was like, you know, Money is a big part of adulting and yeah. nobody's talk, nobody's connecting those two things. Mm -hmm. And so adulting is easy was available on Twitter. I grabbed it in 2017 and then I didn't do anything with it until 2019. Got it. Got it. So now you're involved with House Money Media. Tell us about House Money Media, how that came about, what the impetus was and what you guys have been up to recently. House Money Media started as this idea that Every content creator doesn't need to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. So I knew I was going to be leaving my job in 2023. And I knew, okay, I need to redo my website. I need to collect more emails than I have. I need to get a newsletter going and all of that. I was prepared to do that. And then, you know, my friend Alan was talking about like, oh, I need to expand to Instagram and YouTube and I have the podcast and I'm writing, I want to write a newsletter, but I don't have the bandwidth. And we sort of started talking about what do we like to do? Mm -hmm. And what if, what if we could make content creating more about doing what we like to do? Mm -hmm. And we believe again, and this is another like partnership, right? That the, like the sum is greater than us individually. Sure. The pie is greater. You know, there'd be more sponsorship on opportunities, a bigger audience, more people to teach about real estate and reach. And so that's the idea. That's why we came together. So I run the podcast. He runs a newsletter and the website. I manage our virtual assistant. And so we have the podcast, the newsletter, we have our website, and then we have paid courses and a paid discord with coaching as well. And so that's really what, what House Money Media is. Just We're just getting going, just scratching the surface. And we just did, we're coming out with episode, you know, probably when this comes out, we'll be around episode 30 mm -hmm. of that new podcast. So it's, it's, been, it's been really fun and it is really nice to have someone to bounce ideas off of because... Yeah. 
content creating can be such a oh. solo, lonely thing sometimes. 100% agree with that. So, so do you have a nice kind of breakdown of job responsibilities? It sounds like he's doing the newsletter, you're doing the podcasting. Do you ever do a podcast together where you're hopping on a call together and, and talking to a guest? Yeah, yeah. He's always, he's always on, on the podcast yeah. with me. Okay. But That's in terms of like planning it, so there's an interview portion and yep. we have a guest host. And so I have to obviously record the interview before we record with the guest host because part of what we do is react to the interview. Yeah. And so I'm juggling those schedules. And then I also, you know, pick the titles, manage the editor and things like that. So, just, you know, I'm in charge of that. Got also, it. like we got on a call just before this where he's like, this is my idea for this for the next blog, which is part of the newsletter. And we're talking through that. And then I've helped him a little bit with, you know, I've given him some content to write blogs about short term rentals. Mm -hmm. and things like that so yeah we spearhead certain things neither one of us like there's nobody that's like super in charge of our sponsors mm -hmm. you know he has the sponsors that he's kind of brought into the fold that he invoices and talks to and right. i have the sponsors that i talk to and as far as social media goes it's a little bit divide and conquer he's handling twitter right now and then i'm handling all of the other ones through our va mm -hmm. so yeah we have a pretty good division of duties and if anything new comes up we're pretty good about figuring out who should do it yeah there's really not a lot of strife we we really think alike and we're very aligned on the vision for the business and that just makes decision making really easy yeah and the newsletter what is it called and how often is it does it come out it's called the money drop comes out weekly so that you know that we have oh, a social media post from one of us for the week we have whatever the podcast was for the week and whatever the blog was for the week in the newsletter got it i wanted to touch on this twitter uh, post that you that you had hmm. that kind of piqued my interest. You you had posted a question on whether twenty somethings should be maxing out their four hundred one ks or not, and Elon Musk responded. Can you tell us about that? What his response was and how you if you had any further interaction with them or I wanted to hear about yeah. that because that's kind of cool to <laughs> so have this, Elon so a, respond. It seems like a very basic question, but it's actually a little bit nuanced, yeah. right? Because four hundred one ks. You can max them, which is something around $20,000, $22,000 is the most that you could put in and get the tax benefits is what the U.S. government says, right? right? And you could also max the match. The cool thing about 401ks is a lot of employers give you a match portion. So mm -hmm. for example, you put in 5%, they put in 5%. I believe that 20 something should not max their 401ks. I did. We've talked about that a lot. I wish I didn't. If I could mm -hmm. go back, I'd take that money back. Right. Because I don't need, I'm not going to need it when I'm 59 and a half. I need it now. Yeah, exactly. Right? So I, I believe in maxing your match, though. If yeah. your company's given 5%, you better put 5% in there. Right. But so the question says, should you max your 401k? I agree with Elon. I think the answer is no. I don't think you should put the full $22,000 unless your company's matching that amount. Um, and so, no, he didn't read He I didn't reply anymore. I sent that to my parents. Mom's like, but why does he feel that way? He needs to say. I'm like, mom, he's like... <laughs> Literally one of the most important people in the whole entire world. Okay. Right. So no, he didn't say anymore, but no, Elon and I both agree that you should not max your 401k if you're in your twenties. I think you should max your match. I wonder if he would feel that way. The world may never know though. The world will never know. But you didn't respond to him. You didn't say like anything back. It was just. Okay. So he sent that at like 4.30 AM and oh, I didn't okay. see that he, it never popped up in my notification. So I didn't even see that he had replied for like 10 hours. Oh, okay. Interesting. But, yeah. Um, I wanted to hear about like a contrarian personal finance take that you have. Anything that comes to mind? Aside from... I mean, there's people on both sides of every argument, but I'm like pro mortgage yeah. and debt. Uh -huh. uh, like some people are like, I, you should have no debt. And I just wholeheartedly disagree. Personally, in my life, my husband and I are worth two and a half million dollars at 34 and 31 years old. Mm -hmm. We'd be worth maybe one yeah. if we didn't use leverage. And I would still be working right. my job. I mean, it's it's that big of a deal. Yeah. Another one that just kind of comes to mind, like Robert Kiyosaki, the rich dad, poor dad guy, says that your house is not an asset. But I, I agree with you. I, I mean, I've always made money and done well on my personal residences. I've kind of done live-in flips with them. So, but Yeah, I mean... An asset is something you own mm -hmm. and you either own that outright, like with equity, yeah. or you also take a loan on it to own it with liability. I mean, there's like 
That's the accounting formula. Sure. It's not debatable. It's an asset, like period. Right. If you want to split hairs, if you're talking about your statement of net worth, it's a personal use asset. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I use this example. If someone's like, I don't count my car in my net worth. I'm like, well, like, do you own your car outright? Yeah, I own my car. How much is your car? Yeah, fifteen thousand dollars. Okay, if if the crap hit the fan, could you sell that car for fifteen thousand dollars and then buy one maybe for five and use the ten thousand for something? Right. Yeah, that's also why it's an asset. Right. Same with your house. Now, I do think your house should go per purely in your personal use assets category. If you're planning on living there your whole life, paying it off, retiring there, and dying there, your net you can't use it. You can't use it as an investment. So it doesn't go in your investment asset. But I mean, even if you're going to use half your equity to downsize and retire off of, eh, put half of it, half of it in your investment assets on your statement of net worth if you want. I'm cool with that. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to hear a little bit about um, some of the biggest mistakes that you see 20 and 30 somethings making with their finances. Like, wh what is it that makes you just hit your head and just be like, oh, gosh, you know, like what what are the biggest mistakes? Well, I don't know what every 20 year old's financial life looks like, mm -hmm. but I know a lot of them buy cars and get car payments. Yeah. Which I'm not necessarily against. I don't think you need to buy beaters. But if you are stretching at all, if you're buying more car than you should buy, if your car payment is $700 a month is like the average on a new car, it's crazy. I don't care if you do that, but I want you to look me in the eyes and tell me that it's more important to you than vacations. It's more important to you than your 401k. It's more important to you than your Roth if you're not doing any of those things. Right. Because it is implicitly holding you back from doing some of these things that you are probably telling your family and friends that you're going to do that you wish you could do, mm -hmm. but you can't. So that, that the biggest thing is it's just, it's the car. I mean, everybody, so many people graduate from college and they get that car payment right away. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, can you, can you not? Like, do you need it? And, or do you just really, really want it more than anything else? Yeah. One of my favorite guests that I had on, uh, it's been a while. He played uh, football in the NFL, Devon Kennard. I don't know if you've come across. Oh, him. yeah, I had him on. You had DK on. Yeah, yeah, he's great. Yep. He drove like at, once he got uh, drafted into the NFL, I forget what round he went in, maybe fifth or something like that. Doesn't matter. He continued to drive his high school car that he that he drove like, you know, his first two seasons in the NFL. He was driving his high school yeah. car. Yeah, he told me. Which that. I think is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I drove my first car. I bought my first house before I bought my second car, uh -huh. you know, and that was my Mustang money for the record. I was going to buy a Mustang and bought a house instead. Right. It was a good move. Yeah. I still don't have a Mustang. Got a bunch of houses, I guess, but, right. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Lauren, this has been a lot of fun. I really want to, you know, thank you for your time. Is there anything mm -hmm. that we sure. didn't touch on that you wanted to to discuss? I guess the one other thing I'll say about the genesis of adulting is easy is that it started in 2019 as a podcast to teach my little sister about money. Mm -hmm. And so in 2019, I would have been 29. So she would have been 16. She was in high school then. And so that's really how it started. And some of that has to do with our brother was, you know, and he was dealing with an addiction at the time. Mm -hmm. And so our parents really had a split focus. I mean, you're you're already behind the eight ball. If there's two of you and you have three kids, you can't be all, at all the places at the time. Yeah, right. And then there were times where they were very focused on him. And so I, I had always taught her a bunch of things. I was like, you know what? I'm going to teach her personal finance. So that's how it started. I just wanted to get that out there as well. It's now morphed into teaching more than just her. Yeah. Uh, but but that is that's part of it. You know, it's like a. I'm a I think of myself as a really big sister. Yeah. And I hope that some of my listeners get that vibe too when they're listening to adulting is easy. That's really cool. That's a great story. I think like having that ideal person that you're whether you're podcasting or writing or tweeting about, like having that kind of ideal uh person is like super helpful. And particularly so if it's a relative, you know, it's just like okay. high motivation there. So really cool stuff. Lauren, this has been a lot of fun. Where can our audience go to learn more about you, learn more about what you're up to, that kind of thing? I am Adulting is Easy on Twitter and YouTube. I am Adulting is Easy Real on Instagram. 
If you're interested in the House Money Media side of things, you can go to housemoneymedia.com, the podcast, blog, newsletter, courses, everything is there. Cool. I'll put all this in the show notes. And thanks again for your time, Laura. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks for having me. But I found that there is not a resource for people to look at themselves and look at their own life and say, these are my personal values. This is my risk tolerance. These are the resources that I can bring to bear. And how do I go from where I am today and achieve whatever my financial goal is using real estate? And there's, there wasn't really a way to, to create that roadmap. And so that's where the idea came from.